it's me i'm back for another video um tonight i just wanted to do a nightcap with you guys because i wanted to share with you all <clears throat> my testimony um just where i've been and how far i have come and how god has carried me throughout every single step so here we go my testimony so I was born in a island, on an island. I am of West Indian descent. I was born there. I came to America when I was two years old. Um, now I was born to a mother who was a drug addict and a drug dealer. How'd that work out? I don't know. Um, but uh, my grandmother who had uh, ventured to America kept getting calls stating that, you know, you might want to check on your grandchild. She's down here with um, your child and she's not being tended to properly. Um, so my uncle who had moved to America had um, decided, he and his wife had decided to file for my mother and I to be able to come to America. <clears throat> and we did so. Um, we went from uh, the island that I was born on and then we went to the Bahamas and then from the Bahamas, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Um, from the Bahamas, we um came over to America, and you know this was during the time where uh the crack epidemic was huge in America. So it went from being on an island and uh being on drugs to being in the United States, and the drugs are just rampant on the streets and just really prevalent <clears throat> during that time. So you know my mom got hold of that. And it just really became her life. It consumed her. So now here I am, this young child um, in America. And my mother would creep out of windows, uh, essentially, to get her fix. Um, my grandmother would think, okay, uh, she's in the next room with me. When, in fact, she had already creeped out um, to go one street over to where the crack houses were and the drug houses were. We lived in what you would call the, um, I guess, the projects. Um, so it was really easy to have access to those things. So um, moving forward, my grandmother, essentially, she did raise me. Um, it got to the point where my grandmother decided that enough was enough. She was going to take my mother to court. She took my mother to court and had the court um, terminate her rights as a mom um, so that she could then be my um, mother. She adopted me. My grandmother did adopt me, and she filed for my citizenship here in America um, under the notion that if anything was to ever happen to her, I would be okay. I wouldn't be sent back. I wouldn't be deported. I am a U.S. citizen. There was nothing that they could do about it, right? Um, so growing up, it was hard. Um, my grandmother raised me. My grandmother had fell ill. Um, <clears throat> and I ended up a lot of the time growing up faster um, than, you know, a lot of people. You know, it was my job to go grocery shopping. It was my job to keep the house clean. It was my job to do a lot of things that, you know, other kids my age didn't necessarily have to deal with. I remember my grandmother falling ill really bad one time, and um, we went to the hospital, and they're like, you have to stay, and we didn't have anywhere for me to go. And, and they're like, well, we're going to have to uh, take her to foster care. And, you know, I never seen someone... Um, who was in pain, uh, fight so hard to keep someone else, um, me, out of foster care. So um, the DCF people came, and they put me in the car, and next thing I knew, like, you know, my grandmother, I left the hospital, you know, kicking, screaming, and my grandmother just calling everybody, calling everybody, hey, can you please help? Hey, can you please help? Just take her, please. Just don't let them take her, because she knew if they took me, um, will be singing, you know, a whole different song. They already had a foster care for me, um, for me to go to, and it was quite far away from my home. It was some, some towns away. Um, and she would have to prove that she was able to care for me, um, had they actually gone through with it. Um, essentially, uh, one of our church family members did decide to take me. Um, they took me. I lived with them for a while while my grandmother stayed in the hospital. Um, we found out she had a hornea. And um, she had to undergo chemotherapy and she lost her hair. And, you know, watching someone you love go through chemo is difficult. But 
watching it as a kid and knowing that's the only person you really have is really traumatic. It is really, really traumatic. Um, so, you know, I watched it go through chemo. Um, it was so bad that my uncle had decided to come down and he took me while my grandmother, you know, got better. Um, he took me to live with him for a while and I lived with him and his family for um, half of a school year to kind of give me a sense of normalcy uh, to, you know, um, just stabilize my life because my life was, it was rocky. Um, and then, you know, she got a little better and then she would get a little worse. And, you know, at that time, um, a lot of my family had moved out of the state we lived in to, um, to go to another state. Um, so my cousins came down to, you know, kind of assess the situation at this time. I was a little bit older. Um, I was, you know, 15 at the time. Yeah, I was 15. And, you know, my cousin came down with her report back to my aunt who had lived in another state was, you know, your grandma's not doing so well. She, you know, has this child down there. She, she could barely, you know, take care of herself, let alone a child. Um, I think it's time for grandma to move, you know. So my grandmother told me, you know, it was my first year of high school, you know, all my friends from kindergarten up were all going to high school, woo! And next thing I know, halfway through high school, you know, not even really half, it was halfway through high school, you know, in the state I was going to in the school year, it was like maybe just going into second semester uh, where I, ha I was living. And I had to move. I had to start over. And I, I moved to the new state, kicking and screaming, literally. I cried, you know, my mother cried, my mother, um, because me and my mother, although... Although she had problems, we were still very close. Um, and we moved. And subsequently, when we moved, a few months later, my grandmother did uh, pass away. Now, when my grandmother was on her deathbed, she would always tell me, she prepared me for her passing. She would tell me, when I die, people are going to treat you differently. When I die... You're going to really see people's true colors. Everyone's nice to you now because I'm here. And I never really took heed to that. I never really understood what she meant by that. I'm sorry. Anytime I talk about my grandma, I just cry. Um, I never really understood that. And I was just like, okay, okay. Um, So uh, she wasn't feeling well. And I kept telling her, you know, you should go to the hospital. She goes to the hospital. Um, she went and, you know, they had to perform surgery on her. And um, they performed the surgery and she wasn't the same. They let us know that she would um have to use a catheter to pee. Um, they had to cement her stomach, um, all kinds of just horrible things, right? And I remember going to visit her in the hospital and couldn't recognize her, just didn't look like her. And I remember she went into cardiac arrest several times and it was Father's Day of 2004 when my cousin and I was out with, I was with my cousin and, um, we were out and we received a phone call and it was the hospital saying, you might want to come on. And we went and they just let us know like, she's not, she's not going to make it. She keeps having cardiac arrest and we can't keep resuscitating. So, you know, we're crying. And um, one thing my grandmother had made me promise her was that I would always stick close to this particular cousin. Um, that was the cousin that I needed to be very close with. That was the cousin that no matter what, I needed to stick with her. Um, and also to never go back to the state I was in. Don't go back to my mom. And I made those promises to her and I kept them. Um, so... I promise you guys, uh, when she departed this life, um, I'm pretty sure I, I witnessed that, um, because I just remember 
her her chest. It just seems to like expand, like she was taking a huge breath. Although I knew like it was impossible, um, but her chest expanded, and I feel like to this day, years later, that it was in that moment she left us. And went on to glory. I, I truly feel that. And the only people that saw that was me and my cousin. We were the only two people in the room when that incident happened. I felt like when she knew that I was there and she knew she was there and we had said our goodbyes and we made these promises to her, um, she could let go. Okay, so... You know. Okay, so when she passed away, um, life got very difficult, guys. I was 15 years old. It was just a few weeks before my 16th birthday. Um, okay, guys, let me get it together. Hold on. Oh. And this is just going to be unedited because we're just talking. We're having our nightcap. Okay, so I was 16, um, I was 15 years old, and, um, it was just a few weeks before my 16th birthday, and it stung, because, you know, me and her, you know, I called her mama, uh, we talked about how great it was gonna be when I turned 16, and we made all these plans, and here we are, and can't do any of it, uh, so as time goes on. Uh, the question becomes, well, who's going to take care of Shan's hell? Nobody wanted me. <laughs> um, nobody wanted to raise a kid that wasn't theirs. And um, because of who my mom was, I feel like there was some animosity there. Um, but anywho, I ended up with my aunt. And it was pure hell. And not from her, but from the person she was married to. They could not stand me, okay? I had to pay rent. You know, the state was giving me money because my grandmother had passed away and she was technically my mom on paper. So they give you money when a parent passes away to kind of aid in... In, in your care. Um, so I would get this money and I immediately um, had to take a good chunk of that money and give it to the people I was staying with. Um, I had to, you know, pay for food. Uh, I got a job when I turned 16 um, and the job required me to work late hours. Um, and I had to walk home. Many a night, you're talking about walking home at 12 at night, 1 o'clock in the morning. It was absolutely absurd for a child my age to be walking the streets at those times. And let me just tell you about God. God, you know, he always covered me. Because I remember walking home one night. And if I don't know if these men had been... I guess stalking me, um, but it's like they knew I was coming, because I remember I was walking down the street, and this is a, a fairly busy street, but it was very late at night, no one should be out there, you know, walking the streets at night, especially a young 16 year old young lady, and I just remember it was a van, and the guy had hopped out of the van, and then the van kept going, and the guy was um, walking near me, and he was just like, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am, um, do you have a cigarette? And I remember thinking in my head, I'm 16, do it look like I would have a cigarette? But me being polite and him being an older man, I was just like, I just, like, as he got closer, there was a church at the corner. And I grew up in the church. Because just everything around me just felt wrong. I was very scared, um, but it just didn't feel safe. And I just said, no, sir, I, I don't. 
I, I don't have a cigarette. And then I started leaning more toward the church because I was like, that over there is holy ground. I'm a child of God. If this man tries anything, all I can do is cry out to Jesus to save me. And I remember um, he just kept getting closer to me. And I just walked faster and walked faster. And the street that I had to turn on, the van appeared. And the van was open and another man was in that van. And I just remember looking around. And it was just like a scene out of a movie. And I'm like, there's no one out here. And all I knew to do was call on Jesus' name. Okay, people? I stood at that church. I didn't even run. I just stood there. And I just started screaming. And I was calling down Jesus and every single angel. I was binding these people in hell. I was... Look, to this day, it was nothing but God's grace that got me out of that situation because I promise you, I promise you, when I started calling on the name of Jesus and I, I was just there at the church just praying and telling God, you know, just get me out of this situation. In Jesus' name, send down your archangels, Lord Jesus, send the sword, send people to scare them away, let them see something that I cannot see. Slay the, hmm. These men... The man who was pursuing me ran back to the van, shut the door like he had seen a ghost. You hear me? And just took off down the street. And I have horrible asthma, and I promise you it was nothing but Jesus. It was nothing but Jesus. Because I felt like I didn't have asthma anymore. And I ran the rest of the way home. Okay? So God will protect his children, no matter what you are going through. And in that situation of being there, I wasn't treated very well. I really wasn't. Um, there were times when um, the people I was staying with would call my friend's parents. And um, the disrespect was so real. would ask them, um, how much would you need to keep her? Yeah, and that really, it really, really did something to me, you know, because I went from having love and having so much to having nothing. And I remember one night, I was just sick of it, Um, and I cursed Jesus out. I was, I was so mad at God, so mad, like, just why, Lord, would you take the one person who would give it all for me? And leave me here to deal with this foolishness. And, you know, as I get older and I look back, I see God was saying, but I helped you every step of the way. Every step from days where that incident happened to days where um, I just got tired of the foolishness where I was. And I walked out of that house. I gave them that key. I was 17 years old. I gave him back the key. And I was done. I had no plan. I had no nothing. All I had was my book bag and the shirt on my back. And I remember I went to school and I told my friend, I was like, I'm homeless. I have nowhere to go. But I refuse to go back there. And I can't go back there. And I remember in that moment, she called her mother. And was like, Mom. Can Chantel stay with us? And her mom was like, yeah. Because I already had plans. Um, I was dating a guy at that time who was in the military. And um, he had helped me. And they, the plan was for me to start college, you know, uh, that following August. And um, I just needed to graduate from high school because I was still in high school. And I just needed a place to rest my head. And so it was time for me to go um, away to college. Um, in which I would have to just figure it out at that point. But, you know, guys, through it all, through it all, as many times as I felt like God just left me out to dry, he really did always protect me. 
there was always someone, if I look back in my life, no matter how many tears I've cried, no matter how many times I just didn't know how it was going to happen, God always made a way out of no way. I'm talking about days where I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from, and then I would go to work and the guys at my job, because I was the only girl, became my family. And they'd be like, oh, let me give you some dinner. Let me do this. Didn't nobody really know. There was a select few that knew what was happening in my life, but not a lot of people. So, um, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. Um, hold on. Um, so, I, I, I know there's people out there that's going through hard times and you just can't see the end of the tunnel. But I'm trying to tell you, if you just hold on, it's going to be okay. I mean, now I'm way older. I'm way older. I graduated from college. I have an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. And right now I'm working on my master's degree. So let me tell y'all something. Not a devil in hell can take away what God has for you no matter what. I have my two beautiful children and life is, you know, is not the best, but life is good. It's not what it used to be. I have a lot to be thankful for. I could have been somewhere else, but I'm not. When I was 22, I had a nervous breakdown, but God, I was I was on Xanax because my stress level was through the roof that I could not, I just couldn't. Everything was just, I felt like walls was closing in on me. I would have panic attacks and just totally freak out and be up in a hospital, not know what's wrong with me, just feeling like I'm dying, just the anxiety was too much. But even in that, even in all of that, God sent an answer. Because he gave me a doctor who was like, you're too young for me to keep you on Xanax. I am going to send you to therapy. And I'm not going to send you to any therapist. I want you to see a Christian therapist. Because we need to get you back connected to something that's going to make you whole again. Because you're holding on to too much and it's tearing you apart from the inside out. So I'm going to give you these Xanax for a month to calm you down some. But after that, you have to rely on Jesus for the rest. So in an age where medicine is so prevalent, to have a doctor tell you that they're only going to prescribe you this medicine for such amount of time, and other than that, they're going to put you in therapy with a Christian therapist who can open your eyes to some things, put you back in, in in the right connect. And when I tell you, um, it's very rare that I have a panic attack. Now, not saying that they totally subside because there are times where I get overwhelmed and I'll have a panic attack, but I can identify that little devil and I can shut it down and where I don't need a Xanax. Before, I couldn't do that. I was absolutely scared. Hold on, guys. My nose is doing the most. So, you know, not everybody wants to see you win, sweetheart. But I promise you, if you just hang on and stay prayerful and stay faithful, that God will never steer you wrong. And sometimes it's not going to look like the sun is going to shine again. You're going to feel like you're losing more than you gain. And in fact, there are times where you will lose more than you gain. But it's all for the good in the end. All the experiences that I've had, I've had lots of people tell me in my life, you've had to go through the experiences that you've gone through in order to grow in, a, in, in order to impact other people that have gone through the same thing. Now I have full understanding of 
what it means to be hungry. I have a full understanding of homelessness. I have a full understanding of brokenness. I have a full understanding of loss. I have a full understanding of betrayal. I know what it means to have a nervous breakdown. I can tell you what it means to have a mother in the system. I can tell you what it means to have um, um, a loved one with cancer. I, I can speak on a lot of things. I can tell you what it's like to be addicted to to um to over the counter uh drugs because I used to take painkillers like they was like there was tic tacs and I couldn't function without one and if I didn't have one I would have to I would just go crazy because I would have a headache because I didn't take my headache medicine. But God, I'm just telling y'all my story to show you guys that there is light at the end of the tunnel. No matter how bad it looks, it's not that bad. Keep prayed up. Keep positive people in your life. And keep grinding. And the sun will come. And I promise you the sun will come out. Okay? Love ya. <laughs> I know, right? Long night cat, but... I just wanted to talk to you guys about some of my experiences in life. If you have any questions, leave them down below.